This is a statement through, uh, from the Centers for Disease Control, and it's looking at the American Lung Association and a couple of other websites. It all pretty much say the same thing regarding COPD. Uh, it's a dangerous group of diseases that restrict airflow and cause trouble breathing. It includes emphysema and bronchitis, and the chronic uh, lower respiratory disease, uh, including COPD, is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And I found this kind of interesting that 15 million Americans have been diagnosed with COPD, and then two decades ago, more than 50% of adults with poor pulmonary function were not aware they had COPD, so that number may actually be higher than, than we know. And this is uh, from the Centers for Disease Control as well, and this is their data collection on uh, H uh, satellite death rates per 100,000. And as you can see back in the, in the 90s, late uh, 90s, we were up at kind of high, and it's kind of trending downward and uh, spiking back up. My only assumption on that, and this goes up to 2010, my only uh, thought on that is that unfortunately a lot of our chronic COPDers have passed and of those, right about that time that we really started getting after people about smoking, not smoking in public uh, areas and trying to convince everybody to quit. So at least we're headed in the right direction but it's still pretty high there and it's broken down into male and female and then the uh, center line is the combined total. And then this was from the uh, CDC government who are regarding for California, about 4.6% of the population of California residents surveyed in 2011 have been told by a health care provider that they have COPD. Now that's just saying that COPD, there's been no really diagnostic test to actually prove that they have that. This is just what the physicians are saying. With that, uh, they did a survey and it says that you were more likely to report you had COPD if you were age 65 or older or female, unable to work, divorced, living or separated, current smoker, and a history of asthma. Uh, you were less likely to report if you were 44 years or younger, were male, never smoked, a household income of greater than 75,000, had never smoked, and had no history of asthma. For our uh, local spot here in White Memorial, uh, through our uh, organizational excellence, uh, we were able to get some statistical data on primary and secondary diagnoses for COPD. So for 2012, 3,793 encounters. In 2013, 3,833 encounters. That included both the ED and actual admissions into our facility. In 2012, 2013 combined, there were just over 420 readmissions for COPD with an estimated cost of about $4.5 million in non-chargeable patient care expenses. In other, uh, it costs more to manage the COPD patient the second time around than it did on the first time. The numbers that they gave were, these were real costs, and this was back in like, 2008, uh, was about 7000 for the first admission of uh, real costs, and then the second admission was up to 11000 in real costs, and that's per patient. So with the ever-changing ways of doing patient care and keeping with cost reductions and CMS payment structures, we've been forced to rethink our practices in health care. Uh, managed care and other insurances companies are following that same suit and basically saying, in case you didn't know, if a patient gets readmitted uh, with the same diagnosis within 30 days of discharge, we get nothing. We have to absorb that cost. And that's why now the focus is working on COPD management better education, better uh, medication management, so on. That's, we're going to be touching base on those uh, through the symposium. So why are we here today? We're going to learn how to reduce readmissions by better management for signs and symptoms and medication management, uh, how to get patients uh, into programs that will benefit them, uh, and then advantages of medical disciplines within the hospital working together to better manage COPD. This is not just a one discipline, this is not just respiratory. Everybody in this house is pretty much involved in an interdisciplinary team to try to reduce those COPD admissions. And then on the last part, uh, we're going to learn about our pulmonary rehab program. For those of you that don't know, we just started this program uh, last year, beginning of last year. It's been a slow, arduous, trying to get the word out there that we've got it. Uh, but we are seeing patients now. And Ms. Joanna is one of our uh, therapists that helps out in that program. So let's go ahead and get started. He is... Uh, Past president of the American Association of Respiratory Care. I'm just going to read a real quick bio on him. Uh, Patrick Dunn is president of Healthcare Productions Incorporated, a respiratory care training, development, and strategic planning enterprise located in Southern California. Patrick is a true veteran of the respiratory care profession. <coughs> He's received his formal respiratory therapy training at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and later obtained both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UCLA. 
For over 40 years, he has been highly visible and articulate spokesman for respiratory therapists in all practice settings. In 1991, Patrick served as president of the American Association for Respiratory Care, our uh, governing body for us. Uh, he currently serves the profession as a member of the executive committee of the International Council for Respiratory Care as, and as a trustee for the American Respiratory Care Foundation. In 1998, Patrick was elected as a fellow of the ARC and was the 1999 recipient of the Invicare Award of Excellence in Home Respiratory Care. In 2000, he was awarded the ARC's prestigious Jimmy A. Young Medal for meritorious career service and was the 2011 recipient of the Toshiko Koga and the uh, ICRC's, I better be able to pronounce it, <laughs> the uh, highest honor for promoting the globalization of respiratory care. Uh, in addition to foregoing, Patrick is now recognized as a leading authority on the challenges and opportunities facing respiratory care profession under health care reform. So uh, please welcome. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, my job is to live up to that expectation. <laughs> I promise I will do it. And I think Rick did a very good job of setting the stage for the crisis that we now face with COPD in our health care system. I have uh, given permission to download these slides and use them as handouts, so if you want a copy of these slides after the presentation, just talk to Rick or Lana, and it is all my work, it's all privileged information I share with you openly and willingly for you to share as you want. The whole job today is to try and bring this COPD urgency into a bigger picture so you can understand how it fits into White Memorial. And I must say, I was really looking at the statistics, and you've actually had an increase uh, in the last year and a whole in terms of the number of encounters. So your COPD patient population is not staying static or going down. It's inching up. And as the baby boomer phenomenon continues, that's going to continue to go up because there is a lot of undiagnosed or yet to be diagnosed COPD. Now, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, again, since this is a continuing education presentation, we have to make sure that we disclose the fact that I do have professional relationships. If I mention any product, it's strictly in the context of what that product is used in my presentation. None of these organizations in any way, shape, or form control the content of my presentation. So what I'm about to say is basically my own work based upon what I've observed, what I've read in the literature, and what I do in my practice as a volunteer with the Lung Association. What we're going to do today is review the provisions and the timelines of Medicare's new readmission reduction program. This is all related to the Affordable Care Act that was signed into law in 2010. And it has a lot more meaning for us today because our respiratory patients are now front and center. We want to list the clinical and economic impact of COPD and associated comorbidities. That's the big problem, as Rick astutely pointed out. This is not just a respiratory phenomenon. We have a lot of comorbid conditions that require the input of other practitioners who have experienced that, and I'll explain more of that. This is a big unknown. This is the area that's really going to grow significantly. Uh, list the evidence-based care guidelines for the inpatient treatment of COPD admitted for an exacerbation. I'm going to share with you what is now considered to be the gold standard in terms of how these patients should be cared for when they're admitted to the hospital. And also identify areas of care that a lot of physicians have been prescribing for years, but now we recognize there's no evidence to support that type of care, and it's actually kind of unnecessary care. So we'll give you a different perspective on that, and then you can have some nice dialogue with your prescribing physicians. And finally, describe the potential strategies to help reduce all-cause 30-day COPD readmissions. And this is the first step, to have symposia like this to try and get everybody on the same page. Now, I want to just spend one second here, because a lot of people, when they hear me talk about the 30-day readmission penalties, they get very upset because of this word right here, all cause. What that means is that if I have a COPD patient, a hypothetical COPD patient, that's admitted to this hospital for an exacerbation, and we use evidence-based care, and that patient goes home in three and a half, four days, and they continue their recovery, they go to pulmonary rehab, and it's a success story. This patient is actually now much more functional six, seven weeks from now than they were when they came in. A success story. Patient is so successful, they're actually out walking. They're actually out trying to play golf. Now, bear with me. They get hit in the head with a golf ball. They have to come back to the hospital because of that injury. Does that count against COPD? And the answer is yes. People say, well, that's not fair. How many times have you heard that? That's not fair. The reason that Medicare is doing that is they're saying that scenario is very, very rare. What is more happening more frequently is patients will come back 
and it'll be a COPD exacerbation, but they know that if they use that as the admitting diagnosis, they're going to get zinc, so they'll use another diagnosis, pulmonary hypertension, congestive heart failure, pneumonia. Doesn't make any difference. Medicare says all cause. The reason is that we have patients that are coming back for non COPD related. That's not going to happen that often. They basically don't trust people in the healthcare system to tell it like it is. So it is all cause readmission, whether we like it or not, and that's something that we just have to learn to deal with. Now let's look at this hospital readmission reduction program. As I mentioned, it is part of the Affordable Care Act, and it started. In the October 1st, 2012, that would be fiscal year 2013, and there's actually two new payment policies. I'm doing them in reverse order here. I'm doing the second one first, which is this hospital readmission reduction program. Essentially, what hospitals are now being penalized for is if their uh, readmission rate within 30 days of de discharge is considered to be excessive, the hospital is going to be penalized. They're going to have a percentage of their Medicare payment removed at the end of the year. And the question is, we don't really know what excessive is. It's certainly not going to be zero. These patients are always going to come back periodically because they're going to have deterioration of their disease. What we want to stop is that revolving door syndrome. Now, to be fair, prior to the Affordable Care Act, hospital administrators and hospital financial officers would say, when in doubt, readmit the patient. It's another round of reimbursement. It's another way to generate revenue. Medicare is reducing what they're paying for each DRG, so let's readmit these patients over and over and over again as long as they're out of the hospital for 24 hours. And now Medicare is saying, uh-uh, we're not going to do that anymore. So we have to have a fundamental change in our thinking, starting with the administration on down to the clinical caregivers. When they started this program back in October 12, October 2012, these were the three conditions that they identified. And so these were the three targeted conditions for the first three years. We're into the third year of this right now. Was those patients admitted, readmitted for an acute MI, readmitted within 30 days for congestive heart failure or for pneumonia. And the biggest population here are patients coming back from skilled nursing facilities. They're being discharged to skilled nursing facilities, and the care isn't that good, so their pneumonia gets out of control, they come back. So all of a sudden, hospitals are having very serious dialogue with their skilled nursing facilities, who they send their patients to, to make sure that the skilled nursing facility or the board and care facility is aware of the fact that these patients have to continue their recovery. Now, <clears throat> additional conditions were to be added in 2015. So it was a rumor that we're going to have conditions that will affect respiratory. Uh, identified hospitals nationwide in the first year of the program, over 2,200 hospitals were penalized over $280 million. They basically, Medicare could take up to 1% of the hospital's total Medicare payments if they were considered to be excessive in their readmission rate. Notice the second year the number went down, or went up just a bit, basically stayed, but look at the money went down. So hospitals were getting the message, we don't want to readmit those three conditions. And the question comes in, in 2015, the penalty is now going to be up to 3% of Medicare payments. It's going to cap at 3%. So first year was 1%, second year was 2%, Third year, which starts this October 1st, the penalty is up to 3% of your total annual Medicare payments. Now, for the longest time, as I mentioned here, conditions to be added in 2015, that starts this October. October 1st, 2014 is the beginning of the fiscal year for the federal government. And as it turns out, it's no longer a rumor because last May, May 10th, 2013, in the Federal Register, Medicare announced their intention to add COPD as a readmission reduction penalty disease. And that starts this October 1st. Hence, I suspect that's why we're in this room today. Because hospitals across the country now are discovering that COPD, which has been ignored for years, might turn out to be a real financial hardship. And so hospitals are going back and looking at what they've done in the past with COPD and making sure when they go forward, they're aware of the fact that when these patients go home, they need to be able to be productive and continue their recovery. Fiscal year 2015 starts this October 1st, and this is what Medicare is going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at all hospitals across the country for those three years to look at their readmission rate for the, C, for the COPD diagnoses. And they're going to determine what's excessive. Right now, it's estimated that if it's above 20%, you're probably in trouble. Right now, the average readmission rate for COPD across the country is about 24%. Now, I think you probably want to be somewhere in the middle to low teens. I think that's a good target, and I'm sure you're going to be able to figure out what your readmission rate is here if you haven't already. 
Now, so those three years, there's nothing we can do to go back and change that. That's history, and we're going to be penalized. But going forward, what we really want to do is make sure that we can control those readmissions. And I mentioned, when this kicks in, it's going to be a significant penalty. And if they still have their penalties in place for congestive heart failure, pneumonia, or acute MI, as you can see, hospital administrators are very, very nervous right now about this hospital readmission reduction program. Now, about COPD, as was nicely pointed out, it's a systemic disease. It's caused by airflow limitations in the airways and characterized by destruction of the pulmonary gas exchange areas. I put in red here something that's really emerging. We're recognizing now with all this attention on COPD that a lot of these patients have not only COPD, but they have other conditions as well. And sometimes these conditions are related to the COPD. Sometimes they're not, but they complicate the care of the COPD patient. A good example is depression. A lot of COPD patients are very depressed, and it's hard to deal with a person who's mentally unstable in terms of teaching them self-care. And it's why it's very important that pulmonary rehab or something like that be available. There are patients who might have some congestive heart failure in addition to their COPD. They're going to need cardiac rehab as well as pulmonary rehab. So identifying these systemic uh, comorbidities is a very important part of it. It's not just a respiratory condition anymore. That flies in the face of what we've been doing for the last 50 years. It's respiratory. It's a respiratory disease. Now we recognize a lot of the problems with the COPD might be because of deterioration of the comorbid condition. Now we see here the prevalence is increasing, as was nicely pointed out by the epidemiology data that Rick presented, is that prevalence is increasing. We don't know what the total number is. We know that there's probably a significant number of people out there who have COPD but have not yet been diagnosed. And the bad thing about COPD, it's a sinister disease. You don't start developing symptoms one or two or three days after the onset of the disease. It's usually 10, 20 years later that the disease actually manifests itself. So the damage is always done by the time the patients are diagnosed. We have airflow obstruction and we have alveolar destruction and those are largely irreversible. So there is no cure for COPD. And sometimes we dance around that with our patients. We have to really let them know this is something they're going to have the rest of their life. What we really want to do is try and hold these um, deteriorations in check and stop the continued deterioration by appropriate medication and long-term uh, use of medications the right way. The primary cause, I'm not telling anybody in this room what the primary cause is, noxious inhalants. It's a largely preventable disease in that respect. Uh, and I must tell you, it's the fourth leading cause of recidivism. Recidivism is that magic word for that bounce back and I learned something last week that I'll share with you. Have you heard him talk about the revolving door patient or the bounce back patient? How about the frequent flyer? Have you heard that? And someone accused me, you can't use that frequent flyer. And I said, we use it all the time. He says, no, no, it's not right. Because frequent flyer in the normal sense is a positive thing. In other words, you're using your loyalty with American or United or Continental and you're being rewarded. So in that case, it's a positive thing. When you use it here, it's a negative. So I avoid the use of a frequent flyer. I kind of like the revolving door or the bounce back patient. The medical word is recidivism. Recidivism means that you treat, you discharge, and they come back in again within a short period of frame. Now, this is basically, again, a nice risk factor uh, identification. I'm showing it from the global initiative or the gold guidelines. Obviously, we have all these inhalational elements. I mean, I can only imagine what's going on in China. Have you seen the pictures from the smog epidemic they're having in Beijing right now? People are wearing masks they can't see. I mean, it is so bad. You can only imagine the impact on lung health in the People's Republic of China. As we recognize here, there's also a subset of patients who are genetically predisposed to COPD. That's the alpha-1 patients with that deficiency. Never smoked a cigarette in their life, they have COPD. It's a very, fortunately, a very, very small patient population. Nonetheless, it's being highly recommended that when patients are being treated for COPD, that they do that test to rule out the alpha-1 component and make sure it's only related to the COPD abuse of inhalational drugs. We also have infections that cause a flare-up of all these, so that's why we really emphasize annual vaccination for flu and one-time life vaccination for pneumococcal pneumonia. We also have socioeconomic status. Uh, one of the points that uh, Rick brought out was showing what patients are not likely to have COPD, and one of them was an annual income above $75,000. The idea is annual income below that tend to have more socioeconomic depravity, they tend to smoke more, they tend to have a higher incidence of COPD. 
And sometimes that's politically incorrect, but I was glad that you were able to show that slide because that's a, that, that's data, that's a data point. And it's something that we have to take into consideration because that will influence the patient's ability to get their medications. You know, so we really need to be aware of that. And then obviously the aging populations, the smokers, the baby boomers, about 7,000 baby boomers a day for the next five or six years turn 65. That's 7,000 new Medicare people every, every day turning 65. When they turn 65, they join Medicare. And if we diagnose COPD six months or eight months later, we've got a major, major time bomb, as you can see. So the aging population, primarily the baby boomers, have had a love affair with cigarettes. Uh, this is a slide that I adapted from an atlas on COPD. And I just show it to you to kind of identify all the areas where other elements come in to patients with COPD. And again, this is too exhaustive to go into each one of those. We could just spend the whole time. But primarily, this is a real number one killer. These patients, when they have low oxygen, develop pulmonary hypertension, and that puts a lot of extra work on the right heart. And the right heart is a low pressure system that only has to pump blood around the lungs. The left heart is the muscle. That's the one that pumps blood to the whole body. But when you make the right heart work harder because the vessels are constricted because of hypoxemia, it starts to enlarge and atrophy. And that causes what we call core pulmonale. So a lot of our COPD patients already have some degree of cardiac involvement, which would be also their cardiovascular disease. What is not listed up here, it is lung cancer, what is not listed up here is there is now a strong correlation between COPD, the blue bloater, the overweight male, typical male, who also probably has obstructive sleep apnea. So there's a lot of patients, that's called overlap syndrome. So COPD and obstructive sleep apnea sometimes are, co are coexisting. Now, I'd like to show you this slide. This is public data. It's from an, an organization, a nonprofit organization back in Pennsylvania. And what they did from October 1st, 2007 to the following year, September 30th, 2008, there were over 408,000 admissions to hospitals throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And what they did is they went back and they looked at the primary and the secondary and the tertiary diagnosis of those patients. And when you first look at the raw numbers, uh, 57,000 of the patients had COPD as their disease. Uh, 61,000 had congestive heart failure, and down here, coronary artery disease, the acute MI, 94,000. When they went in and looked further, they found out that of those 57,000 patients with, quote, COPD, only really 28,000 of them strictly had COPD. You can see here, 8,000 had both congestive heart failure and COPD. You also had 11,000 that had coronary artery disease and their COPD. And then in the middle, you had over almost 7,800 with all three conditions. So this is really showing I think in graphic illustration that we can no longer just have COPD as our primary focus. We have to look beyond that and recognize there's a correlation between cardiac function and lung function. This is sobering because it really reinforces the multidisciplinary approach that we need to be taking with these patients. Now, the opportunities for improvement, I'm going to show you that care of outcomes is really less than optimal. <clears throat> and I want to make sure you don't take this the wrong way. Some people say, well, gee whiz, what were we thinking? We're just bad people, not giving good care. It's good people trying their best, but under the current system that we've been trying to deal with for the last 25, 30 years, it's not responsive to change. Well, I want to do patient education. Well, is there a billing code for that? Is it a revenue generator? No, well, we can't do it. Well, I want to call the patient at home when they go home to make sure they're going to come back for their visit to the physician in three days. Is it billable? No, well, let's not do it. So we have to get away from that mindset and recognize that some of the things that we wanted to do in the past, but we're told we couldn't do it, now we need to do it. And it's basically good people frustrated by the system that was not responsive to changes. All that's over. That's why the opportunity is gone. There's a high concern about this recidivism rate, this high readmission rate for COPD, and as I mentioned, it's now going to be part of Medicare. Now, I should also point out that all the other payers, not just Medicare, but the state Medicaid systems, including Medi-Cal, uh, the county health systems, and all the commercial insurance companies have said they're going to follow Medicare's law once Medicare gets all the kinks worked out. So this whole new process of penalizing hospitals, at the same time rewarding them for good behavior, is going to go throughout the health care payer system. Unplanned readmissions are costly, and the idea is they're largely preventable because Medicare studies show one of the primary causes of readmission is the patients are not properly prepared for their self-care responsibility prior to discharge. 
Now, we say, well, you know, we talk to these patients, we give them education, and now there's research, and I'm going to sound like a heretic here, but there's research that's showing that with all good intentions aside, when you do patient education to try and change patient behaviors, when you try and do that in the hospital over the course of three days, you're not very successful. Even though you go through all your modules and the patient agrees and so forth, there's just too many other things that get in the way. For example, in the ICU, we now know there's ICU delirium because of all the medications used. When they go out on the floor, there's a lot of pharmacotherapy. It's what we call polypharmacy. Many, many drugs causing the patient to not have all their acuity with them. So we're finding out that these patients need ongoing care once they're discharged. Maybe the purpose of the, the admission and the training is to get them ready for discharge and then recognize they're going to be followed up with a pulmonary rehab program, which I'm delighted to hear that you have. You're ahead of the game with that because most hospitals got rid of their pulmonary rehab program 10, 15 years ago because it wasn't profitable. Now they say, Mike, what do we think? We need it. And again, to be fair, Medicare reimbursement policies probably made hospitals make that decision years ago. They were losing a ton of money. I just heard something at Stephen Breakbush, who's with the Monaghan, told me they're doing out at Kaiser. I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm always taking good ideas and sharing them. What they do before they do any patient education now, they're assessing the patient's literacy level. They're basically going out and saying, now let's see, what will work for this patient? And my God, if that patient has a literacy level of the third grade, it completely changes how you're going to approach that patient versus someone with a literacy level of the eighth grade. I think that's just, and I'm encouraging Stephen to tell those folks to write that up and present it as a paper because how many times do you do patient education and we find out we went through all this and the patient is not cooperating? And we say, well, they're just stubborn. It might be because you just really don't have the ability to understand the knowledge and the way we're presenting it. So patient education is going to be changing. Uh, COPD evidence-based care guidelines exist. I'm going to share with you what they are for inpatient and also what they should be having when they go home. And I must tell you, the evidence suggests that the use of evidence-based care guidelines is pitifully low. And again, people say, well, you know, the physicians are the ones who write all the orders. We're not responsible for that. And I basically say, well, you know, sometimes the physicians are going to have to listen to us and work with their colleagues. And again, physicians are part of that team. It's a team approach to all chronic conditions. This is what we want to try and stop, this revolving door syndrome where the patients are treated, they go home, they come back in. And again, now it was, when in, when in doubt, readmit. Now it's, do we really need to readmit? And there's a lot of people that are saying the last thing we want these patients to do is to go to the ER when they feel bad. Because nine times out of ten, that's going to translate to an admission. So Medicare is trying to change the rules so that physicians are more willing to see patients in their office on an ongoing basis rather than having them admitted to the hospital. Physicians will be also penalized for excessively admitting their patients to a hospital. So Medicare is not just taking this lightly. Now, under treatment of COPD, I'm going to show you something. This is a study that was published in 2006. And it basically was a retrospective study, so that means we look back at the records, so it's not a very tight study. It's not level one or level, it's level two, weak, but it's insightful. It shows information. They reviewed the records of 553 patients admitted, treated, and discharged with a diagnosis of COPD. And they compared that to a cohort of 600 patients admitted, diagnosed, and treated for congestive heart failure. Now, the definitive test to make a confirmed diagnosis, the confirmatory test for congestive heart failure is two-dimensional echocardiography. The confirmatory test for, for COPD is spirometry. And what they're showing here of those 553 patients, only 31% actually had the confirmatory spirometry. Said another way, 70% of these patients were identified as having COPD, were treated for COPD, were discharged with COPD diagnosis, but no spirometry. And so Medicare is basically saying, whoa, well, how do we know that was a necessary admission? See, so we really need to recognize that we need to raise the awareness of the need to confirm the diagnosis of COPD and the risk factors with spirometry. And I'm going to show you some ways that we can address that here. By the way, the cohort, 92% of the patients with congestive heart failure in this study had the requisite two-dimensional echocardiography results in the patient's record. So it really kind of shows that we're way behind the eight ball on this in terms of use of spirometry. This is a record review by Malarski and colleagues published in 2006 and looking at patients with chronic obstructive disease. That would include asthma. 
and they looked at the records again. They're going back and looking at 169 patients with over 1,600 events entered by respiratory therapists, by nurses, by nurse practitioners, by physicians, and they wanted to see how that measured up against these evidence-based care guidelines that are out there. The gold guidelines have been out there for 25 years. And they found out here, subjects received only 55% of the recommended care. And more astonishingly, only 30% of patients being discharged to home with chronic hypoxemia received oxygen. And remember I told you earlier on the problem with hypoxemia untreated, it contributes to pulmonary hypertension, which leads to right heart strain. See, so this is really criminal. 70% of patients who needed oxygen when they went home didn't get it. And again, to be fair, people say, well, you know, that's not my job. I can't prescribe oxygen. The physician needs to do that. But now we will have evidence to work with our physicians to say, you know, Patrick is going home. Uh, we did a kind of a sack on him this morning. We turned his oxygen off for five minutes and talked to him and had him get up, stand up, walk to the bed, and he went down to 86% saturation. He needs oxygen when he goes home. You know, without oxygen, no wonder he's going to come back in. The deficits and variability in process of care with obstructive lung disease represents ample opportunity for improvement. Okay, now these are the evidence-based care guidelines that were first published back in 2001, and they've been updated, and McCrory and his group did what they call a meta-analysis. They went out and they looked at all the literature that was published in terms of what was ordered for patients admitted with an exacerbation of their COPD. And they wanted to see, okay, this is being ordered, now what's the evidence? What's in the literature to support that? Everything on the left, everything on the left side of this chart, there's sufficient evidence of efficacy in the literature by either one or more randomly controlled clinical trials with placebo and with prospective uh, sampling show that when you use one or more or all of these together, it contributes to a positive outcome in the patient's recovery. Everything on the right side, even though a lot of physicians tend to order that as well as all of this, there is no evidence whatsoever that any of those during the acute exacerbation treatment contribute to any improvement in the patient's condition. Now I know, and that's heretical, because I see people still want mucomish, as we were talking before. Well, do, do we don't have the spirometry in the record, so do we put the patient in the wheelchair and take them down to the pulmonary function lab, out of the ICU, or we get the spirometer from the pulmonary function lab, bring it up to the bedside. It's basically shown, this is not a time to do a spirometry. You know, we need it, but this is not the time to do it. Sputum analysis, people say, well, what's wrong with that? They've already been started on antibiotics, and it takes 48 hours for a culture and sensitivity to come back. So all of this really is not being functional. Same with chest physiotherapy and methyl xanthines. The problem with that, of course, is the, the gastric problem with the offlin. And these leukotriene modifiers and masks, this is asthma information. This is not COPD. In this new environment, level 1 and level 2 evidence of efficacy means it's recommended care. This is what you should be doing. And when Medicare does audits, that's what they want to see. With the insufficient evidence of efficacy, it's non-recommended care, and in today's environment where we're really being pushed and pulled, non-recommended care is wasteful care. It distracts us from doing things that we can do, and that's why these informations are out there. Now, what we're going to do with the next study, five years later, some researchers down in Florida in 2005-2006 went back and looked at the records of patients who had been treated since 2001 with an admission of a diagnosis of COPD to see how much of this and how much of this or how little of this and how little of this were actually ordered. And it's going to surprise you. Basically, they reviewed over 69, almost 70,000 records from 360 hospitals to see the degree to which these hospitals' physicians were ordering what was on the previous slide. And what they found was 66% of all those records received the recommended care, which was all on the left-hand side. Now that's pretty good. It's better than the 50% study that I showed you before. But look further. 45% of these people right here also received at least one or more of the non-recommended care. What we really want in the perfect world is everything on the left and nothing on the right, because it's wasteful. And that would be ideal care. Only 30% received ideal care. Again, we identified widespread opportunities to improve quality of care and reduce costs by addressing problems of underuse, overuse, and misuse of resources. And by the way, I have all these articles. They're in PDF. They're in the public domain. If you need any of them, I'll just be happy to email them to you if you can't find them in your library here to justify that. And finally, one last study. This is relatively recent, 2012. It's a retrospective review, but this is Barry Make and his group from Denver Jewish a preeminent pulmonology uh, hospital in the world, 
They looked at 42,000 commercial patients and 8,500 Medicare patients, and what they looked at was prescription refill data, claims data, to see how often they refill their prescriptions. And the idea is we can get an idea into what the physicians are prescribing if we look at the, the prescriptions. And look at what they found. For the commercial, pharma, some of the patients, 60% of these people right here had nothing in their data to show that they were getting pharmacotherapy. So there's no bronchodilator therapy being prescribed, even short-acting or long-acting. And look how high it is for the Medicare patient. Well, if you don't have pharmacotherapy, how are you going to control bronchospasm? And look at this in smoking cessation. 82% of the commercial patients, nothing mentioned whatsoever in the medical record about smoking cessation or smoking cessation support drugs, such as nicotine replacement or patches and so forth. And look at this with Medicare. Only 10% of the Medicare patients had All right, I just basically showed you. Now let's take a look at how that fits in. Notice left or right, if you score 0 or 1 on the modified British, you're to the left because you have fewer symptoms. Or if you score less than 10 on the CAT, you're to the left. You have fewer symptoms. If, on the other hand, your MMRC is 2 or above, 2, 3, or 4, or if your CAT is above 10 and they go up as high as 40, you're to the right. You have more symptoms. Now, these are substitutes. They are not replacements for spirometry. But this allows you, while the patient is in the hospital, to get some semblance of how much at risk they are based upon their symptoms or the lack of control of their symptoms. Now, above or beyond, you know, this, high or low, you can get that from the medical record. You know, they always, I mean, just second admission in the last six months for this patient. All physician history and physicals have that information. So what we're doing is, let's say we had myself as a patient, and you did the cat on me, and my cat was nine. Am I to the left or to the right? I'm to the left. Now the question is, do I go up or do I go down? And let's say I'm to the left and I have low symptoms, but I've been admitted three times. So now, I go above the line because I'm over here. I'm up here in C. Even though I have low symptoms, my risk factors are elevated because of my exacerbation. So what this allows you to do then is to identify those patients who are most at risk for relapse once they go home. And I, again, I stress this is not a replacement for spirometry. It's nothing more than just a temporary place card. What I put in red here is how this correlates with the old gold guidelines should you have spirometry. See, I just kind of superimposed that. So under the old gold guidelines, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. This is one, two, three, four. Notice that the spirometry gets worse. But you want to take these patients and spend more time with them, especially if they're on to the right side, because symptom is a problem. If, let's say you do my, NM, uh, my cat and my cat is 20, that means symptoms are really devastating me. But I've only been admitted once in the last 12 months. That means I'm doing a pretty good job of controlling my symptoms and not going down too. On the other hand, if I had a high score here and I was admitted three times in the last six months, I'm a much higher risk factor than this one down here. I'll put all my priority. This is the one that's going to come back and cost the hospital money. Now, eventually, we want to get spirometry. So that's the new gold guidelines, left or right, high or low. Left or right, top or bottom. It's just either way, those two lines. And then, of course, all this basically shows the correlation with symptoms and risk. This is the old gold guidelines, and you can have copies of this when you get your, your, your handouts. Now, here's where the treatment overlays in terms of the gold guideline. Notice that when you have the basic one, this would be one or A, low exacerbation risk, smoking cessation, vaccination, and short-acting beta agonist, PRN. Now, let's say we have medium. You add to this, this, long-acting bronchodilators, long-acting muscarinic antagonist, pulmonary rehab, and also exacerbation action plan. And usually when people are in pulmonary rehab, one of the first things they do is they do a medication reconciliation to make sure the patient has all the right meds, they can use the meds, and also tell them what to do if this should happen. So pulmonary rehab is just absolutely vital to an ongoing control. And if they have high, this is, this is A, B, C, this will be C, level three, add to these two, inhaled corticosteroids for exacerbation prone, and then these patients probably should be referred to a pulmonologist, or if they're being handled by a primary care, someone who has some knowledge and some better understanding of chronic respiratory diseases. And then you get someone, usually, this is what we usually find out when they first come into the system, if they're very, very, very high risk, poor pulmonary function, you add long-term oxygen therapy, and this is where we might consider some surgical options, such as lung volume reduction surgery. 
So at the same time, these gold guidelines are very, very important for the continuing control once a patient leaves the hospital. The McCrory guidelines were for the inpatient treatment of the patient when they come in with an exacerbation. Now, this was the slide I put up before. And the reason I come back to it, I've circled two things over here just to kind of hone in. Uh, people say, you know, you're getting me confused, Patrick. You just got finished saying that spirometry is woefully underutilized, and yet you're saying we're not supposed to do it. Not when the patient's admitted for their exacerbation. All right? And what about chest physiotherapy? My God, this patient has a bunch of secretions in their chest. Chest physiotherapy is not the way to get rid of those secretions or to help mobilize them. You take a COPD patient who's short of breath, put them in a head-down position, you're going to make them more short of breath. But at the same time, we want to do it. So I'm trying to show you that there are alternative ways here. Now let's look at this. Is the spirometry needed to confirm the diagnosis and grade? And the answer is yes. But we don't do it when the, hospital, when the patient's in the hospital. They don't have the stamina to do a full-on pulmonary function test. They just simply are at their worst. At the same time, they can't exert maximal effort, and any pulmonary function technologist worth their weight will tell you, if I can't have the patient repeat the maneuver to try and get the best possible validity of my study, it's not a good study. And you can barely get one effort out of them, let them alone repeat. Patients just aren't ready for that. And people say, well, what about pre- and post bronchodilator? Wouldn't that be helpful? Well, you know, your COPD largely is irreversible. It's not like an asthmatic who will reverse very quickly. And so why exert the patient through a pre and post FEV1 or peak expiratory fluid? It just really doesn't show much good. Now, the exact make sense then what we do is we make as part of the discharge plan an appointment to get spirometry into their medical record four to six weeks once they've recovered back to baseline. And that's where you can start making some suggestions to the physician and to the patient saying, you know, Patrick needs to come back in and for us. He has no spirometry. We need to get a baseline on him because, first of all, it's required, and secondly, it helps us monitor his progress. Now, that does not mean that we can't do some measure of the patient's ability to breathe. And basically, what about peak inspiratory flow? Now, when I say peak flow, most people say take in a deep breath, hold it, and blow out as hard as you can into this meter to find out what your peak expiratory flow rate is. What we're talking here is about peak inspiratory flow rate. And the reason that's important is because these patients might not have sufficient inspiratory oomph to activate and properly use a dry powdered inhaler. And a lot of the medications out there today for controlled COPD are in a dry powdered inhaler such as teotropium, spirina. It's a very, very good drug, but it's very hard for patients to use that. So what we do have now is this in-check dial, which measures the patient's peak expiratory flow rate, and it identifies whether or not the patient has the, insp or the, expiratory, or the inspiratory capacity to use these devices. And I must tell you, when patients get into that stage three, stage four, their pulmonary function has gone down, the last thing they can do is inhale. And if you don't inhale with enough force, the dry powder only gets to the mouth, they swallow it, and there's no bronchodilatation, they overuse their albuterol. So this is a very, very good test to see if a patient can indeed generate sufficient inspiratory flow to use a dry powder inhale. And then we can tell our physician prescribers, you know, this patient needs a nebulizer. And uh, I was talking yesterday to some people down in, uh, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but they said, you know, yeah, I don't like the way you're talking about this albuterol. The gold guidelines say no more than twice a week. Albuterol. Now, some patients are using it twice an hour, more than that. And she says, my patient, when they get toward the end of their disease, these other drugs don't work. They're taking Spareve, they're taking Advair, and the only thing that seems to work is, is albuterol. And my first question was, you say they're taking, are they getting the medication from the device to the airways? Probably not. I would have loved to have measured those patients' peak inspiratory flow rate. And sure enough, another therapist put their hand up and says, excuse me, I had the same type of patient come in just a couple weeks ago. She was complaining that she's taking her Spareva, she was using her Advair, and she was not getting the relief. I measured her peak inspiratory flow rate, it was 25 meters per minute. I gave her two treatments with nebulized for Motorol, and she felt tremendously better. Here she was going through the motions, and the doctor prescribed it, but no one assessed the patient to see if they could use it. Uh, how about this uh, secretion retention with COPD exacerbation? If a patient has secretions in their airway, uh, that's going to be another obstacle, another obstruction. It increases the work of breathing. And I just got finished telling you, chest physiotherapy is not to be used in these patients. There's no evidence. But it is an airway clearance therapy, known as ACT. 
and secretion of tension, ineffective coughing, is problematic. And these COPD patients don't have an effective cough because of lung function deterioration. And the Trendelenburger, the head down position, is contraindicated in COPD. So here we got a dilemma. The patient has this secretion. We can hear them burling. And they're going through all this motion of coughing. And maybe they need to be taught how to huff cough, which again, pulmonary rehab teaches them how to do that. But at the same time, in the cystic fibrosis patient population, secretion management is absolutely essential for their life. Because that's the one problem that cystic fibrosis patients have to avoid at all costs, and that's secretions. Because it breeds infection, it winds up killing them. So there's all kinds of proven airway clearance therapies used for cystic fibrosis. And I just list them here for you. A lot of these are requiring a lot of attention. This is intermittent percussive ventilation. Uh, this is high chest frequency wall, the vest. And those are good in cystic fibrosis, but also this oscillatory positive expiratory pressure. And so what we have right now, OPEP is a very, very viable regimen for these COPD patients who have a secretion retention problem. We don't just simply ignore them. And the nice thing about this OPEP, it's inexpensive, so it doesn't cost a lot. It is non-invasive. The patient just uses this device and they breathe normally. And it can be used in combination with a small volume nebulizer. In other words, here is an OPEP device, the Aerobica, and you can also use this at the same time you're giving the aerosol therapy treatment. So this combination therapy makes it easier for the patient to take their meds at home. And if they're on the proper prescribed medication, they're only doing it twice a day. And so it's less intrusive into the lifestyle, but yet the outcome is significant. I understand that you're exploring uses of those devices. I want to let you know real quickly, all jet nebulizers are not created equal. I will show you why I'm supporting nebulization for a COPD patient. There is evidence to show why. This is just basically showing an evolution of nebulizer design from the late 70s up until where we are now. This is the old T-piece nebulizer, this is the breath-enhanced nebulizer, and this is the breath-actuated nebulizer. Notice this number down here, respirable dose. As respirable dose goes up, nebulizer efficiency increases. And nebulizer efficiency is determined by how much of the medication that I put into the nebulizer at the end of the treatment is actually in the sweet spot, which is in the airways. That's where the receptor sites are. And what determines that is the particle size of the aerosol coming out of these units. And what we see here is that about 70% of the particles that come out of this device every time the patient inhales are in that 3 to 3.3 micron range. So you get much greater saturation of those receptor sites in the airways. You tend to get a quicker onset of action, shorter treatment times, and that allows respiratory therapists to be better deployed to do other things with this new challenges. Now, I want to show you a study done by a respiratory therapist, and it's at a level one. Very important to show you that nebulizer design does make a difference. This is nothing more than just refreshing your memory about pulmonary function and spirometry and lung values. And what you see here is that there are four primary volumes that make up the total lung capacity. There's the residual volume, the expiratory reserve volume, the good old tidal volume, this is in and out, and then the inspiratory reserve volume. Now what's most important for us with COPD patients is this one right here, the FRC, which is the functional residual capacity, which is made up of the residual volume and the expiratory reserve volume. And then above that is the inspiratory capacity made up of the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. So this is our reserve. Now with COPD gas retention, this point starts moving up, and as that point moves up, say to here, what's going to go down? The inspiratory capacity. In other words, the patient's ability to kind of really pump it up when they need more oxygen in and more CO2 out because of all this airway traffic. So just remember this. FRC, for the most part, is about 40% of total lung capacity. With COPD, it goes up as probably 60%. It encroaches on the patient's reserve to breathe deep. Now let's take a look at what that means in real life. Here's a normal lung. Notice the airways are properly tethered. Here's the waveform. And when these patients, normal patients, like you are, and I in this room, when we go out and we start walking, we need more oxygen because our muscles are working harder. We're producing more CO2. So what happens is we increase not just the rate, but also the volume of our ventilation. We go into that inspiratory reserve that we have holding back there. And that's exactly what we do. Now here's the COPD patient. Notice these airways have lost their tethering. The F force vital capacity is a significant reduction in, in amount. So they have basically up to 60-70% of their total lung capacity. And when they get short of breath, they increase their respiratory rate 
but they can increase the volume because there's nothing left. So they just start breathing faster and faster and faster, and nothing gets better, and they get worse. That's called dynamic hyperinflation. And that's why these COPD patients need pulmonary rehab to learn how to make this not just increase the rate, but also increase the volume. Now here's the study that was published. It was done by uh, Jeffrey Haynes and his, his colleagues. It was published September 2012, peer review. It was prospective. That means they decided what they were going to do before they did it, and who was going to do it, and how they were going to do it. It was randomized. Patients were assigned one or two on a random basis, and it was a controlled trial. The objective was to compare the bronchodilator response with patients who received their bronchodilator with the breath actuated nebulizer to those that received the same bronchodilator with a small volume net. And what they wanted to do is they looked at patients admitted with a COPD exacerbation, and the N of 46 was their intent to treat, but they basically were able to use 40 subjects, 20 in each group. And they all had basically similar characteristics as you would imagine with COPD patients. And the dysmia was secondary to dynamic hyperinflation. In other words, these patients couldn't work or walk because they start really huffing and puffing and they'd be compensating. So that's why they were, you know, they were bedbound. There's no way you can walk them. What they wanted to do is they used a standard medication regimen. They got 2.5 milligrams of albuterol and a half a C, half a milligram of petrobrium. This is a, a duoneb. And they got it Q4. And if the patient needed PRN breakthrough treatments, they could also get another dose of albuterol every two hours, PRN based upon the patient's response. Now, they also monitored all the effects that you would imagine whenever you're giving uh, medication. Now, what the goal of the study was is they wanted to give six treatments of this, irrespective of how many treatments they got here. This was the tr control. They wanted to see at the end of these six treatments if there was any change in the patient's pulmonary function. And what they did is they basically wanted to measure through pulmonary function, the patient's inspiratory capacity. They wanted to see if that inspiratory capacity improved based upon the type of nebulizer being used. And remember, if the inspiratory capacity is here and it improves, it's because we're getting rid of residual volume. We're improving the patient's airflow by giving positive response. Now, here's what makes this study so important. The person who actually did the pulmonary function testing was blinded. They didn't know which patient got which nebulizer. And I think that's very important because that has a degree of unbiased that you can't control. Now let's take a look at what they found out. This is the patient over here. This is the improvement in the inspiratory capacity. Notice the BAM and notice the small volume net, the significant improvement, 0 0.03, very statistically significant that the patient received the BAM had a higher improvement in their inspiratory capacity. You're giving the patient a new breath of life they can actually start breathing deeper and faster at the same time, improving ventilation. And it went on to show that there was no significant change in the border length of stale. But when you can improve a patient who has COPD, improve their inspiratory capacity, it means you're decreasing the amount of air trapping caused by airway collapse. So it really basically shows that nebulizers are not created equal. In this cohort of patients with an exacerbation of COPD, the airway clips was more effective in reducing lung hyperinflation than traditional small volume nets. So the more medication we get to the receptor sites, the better the clinical effect. So nebulizers are not created equal. There is a significant difference. It may be that the band group simply received more medication because in this mode, the mass median aerodynamic, that's the diameter of the particles, was 3 microns in size. So it's a very, very good study to justify that not all nebulizers are created equal. Now, I must tell you, your purchasing agents don't like to hear that. They like to get the cheapest possible nebulizer they can, but that does not make enough sense to really justify it because of the improvements you get with your pulmonary function. This is a very, very good peer review article to justify that changes in design do make a difference. Now, why am I pushing nebulization? This was published in February 2012. COPD is a peer review journal. And Dr. Don from University of Kentucky basically said many patients, especially elderly with COPD, are unable to use their meter dose inhalers and DPIs. Basically, when patients' FEV1 gets less than 40%, they don't have the inspiratory capacity because of the hyperinflation. So you can see why they can't use those dry powdered inhalers. And that's physicians, they love those. And the pharmaceutical companies are doing a great job promoting them. By God, if you want to do something good, put Spiriva in a liquid solution. So we can nebulize it and not have the patient try and do it with a dry powder inhaler. Uh-oh. There we go. Now, this is a basically nebulizer at home. One of the big pushbacks you get is that from a lot of physicians, well, you know, these are cumbersome. Um, they make a lot of noise, and they're not convenient. 
all that's changed. The compressor nebulizers today are just like your laptop computer. You know, they have an internal battery that's rechargeable, they operate off the household outlet, and they can be used in a motor vehicle. So all those inconvenience issues have been addressed by the new technology, and more importantly, it's covered under Medicare Part B. Not just the device, but also the respiratory solutions. So any drug in, a, in an ampule is covered in Medicare Part B as a boy. Part D, which is the donut hole, all your meter dose inhalers and all your dry powdered inhalers are covered under Medicare Part D. So even if a patient could use the dry powdered inhaler, when they're in that donut hole, the way Part D works, you get up to about $1,900 of your benefits starting January 1st. And the moment that all your prescriptions that you've refilled reach $1,900, you fall into the donut hole. And the donut hole means you're going to pay privately up to about $2,500 out of your pocket before your benefits kick in again. And when patients have a choice between refilling their prescription or paying their mortgage or their taxes or buying food, guess what falls off the table? Now, to be fair, the Affordable Care Act, that donut hole, by the year 2020, is going to be gone. But until that time, we have to recognize that prescription access might be a problem for patients under Part D, as in David. So Part B, all patients who have Medicare have Part B because that's how they pay their physician fees. So they all have Part B, it just so also covers the, the Medicare thing. To summarize then, these are the gold guidelines. What we really want to do is reduce the symptoms of the patient. We want to relieve airflow obstruction with good bronchodilator therapy. We want to improve exercise tolerance with good pulmonary rehabilitation and good, good follow-up. We want to improve the patient's health status. We want the patient to be part of their care plan. We want them to be a care team member. And airflow obstruction could also be caused by secretion retention. At the same time, if we do that, we also want to reduce risk. And primarily, the risk is for readmission back to the hospital for a relapse of their COPD. Again, we want to relieve airflow obstruction, improve exercise tolerance, and improve health status. Basically, they all go together. All right, so we want to reduce symptoms and reduce risk, and we see basically we have the ability to do that. All right, reduce symptoms, reduce risk, equals successful disease management. And that's the future, and it seems so easy, but it's very, very complex. Now, in summary, a new COPD care pathway is essential. That's why we're here today. And you're not alone, a lot of hospitals are doing this, and it takes time because you have to get yourself away from your already demanding days. Uh, COPD patients are going to impact the hospital's revenue. I mean, that's, that's happening this October 1st. Uh, patient volume will vary by institution. Some hospitals only see one to two patients. Some patients, some hospitals see six to eight a month, some more than that. I don't know what your volume is, but I think you have to allocate your, re your resources, and I think you have to redesign current workload and advocate evidence-based care, as we talked about here today. You start small, and uh, you've already started. I mean, you've already made the commitment here by virtue of what I've heard so far uh, today. So you're already ahead of the game. You probably have one or two people who are going to be your COPD bird dogs to go out and make sure every COPD patient is getting what we need. And the volume of the patients will drive the program. If you start seeing a tick up in your COPD patient population, you put more resources into that, into that program. And determine the grade risk according to the guide. I think every COPD patient you see from now on, you should do a risk assessment on them. Left or right, upper bottom. Left or right, top or bottom. It's very, very easy when you look at it that way. And I have no problems making life easy for myself. Left or right, top or bottom. Left or right, up or down. And again, it's all about measuring symptoms and spirometry. I also want to make sure the proper medications are prescribed, and that means we have to work with our physicians and make sure these patients have a follow-up appointment to see their physician in five to seven days. Someone did a study, and it showed that 75% of patients readmitted within 30 days of discharge did not see their physician since they were discharged. So there's a strong correlation that these patients need to see their physician within five to seven days. Uh, the AARC is setting up what they call the Best Practices Community. It's no, no uh, accident that it was started a year ago last May, right after uh, Medicare announced that COPD is coming down as a hospital readmission. And they're basically allowing RT departments around the country to post their COPD improvement ideas. And there's all kinds of great information. That's why I want my folks out in Riverside to do that, because I think every time we contribute to this, we help our uh, patients with COPD. And all this is available. 
Now remember I told you that at some point in time hospitals are going to be asked to report on core measures. I think for COPD, eventually Medicare is going to say to the medical records department in all hospitals, these are the core measures for COPD. Tell us how often they occur for every COPD patient that you treat. And the way it works, the medical records people will take a subset of all your, let's say you had 250 COPD patients, and they'll say, okay, we're going to take 40% uh, of those records at random, and we're going to go through and review them. We're going to see if this stuff is in the record. These are the core measures. If they are in the, in the record, the hospital's going to be rewarded. If they're not in the record, the hospital's going to be penalized. And I know they're going to have those core measures. So I'm taking a stab and saying, this is basically what we can consider to be the new core measures because for two years now, physicians who treat COPD patients in their office are being asked by Medicare to report these quality core measures. And here they are, and it should come as no surprise. Smoking cessation, spirometry, bronchodilator therapy, and immunizations. So essentially what my challenge is to you is that every COPD patient starting today that's discharged from this hospital or seen anywhere in this hospital, entry should be made, all four of those, something common about all four. Smoking cessation, discuss it every visit. Are you still a non-smoker? Have you started smoking again? Oh, you fell off the bike. Oh, you're a non -smoker. You've continued with Fantastic. Keep up the good work. Anything I can do to help you. In other words, you want to continually monitor this because if the patient falls off the wagon, Everything you've done has gone out the window. Spirometry, you want to make sure that, and again, if the patient is admitted to the hospital, there's no spirometry, you do your assessment, your record should show, spirometry never done, appointment made in six weeks for a patient to come in and have pulmonary function. When the medical records people are looking at that audit and they see spirometry, yes, the core measure was addressed. Even though the spirometry wasn't done, the core measure was addressed. Immunization and bronchodilator therapy, same thing. The question is, why should we be responsible for immunization? Because we now know that the physicians aren't doing it. They probably tell the patient, but they don't record it in their record. So what we want to do is we want to make sure immunizations discussed with patient, flu shot administered before patient left, patient advised to get their pneumococcal. Pneumococcal is once in a lifetime. Uh, influenza is yearly. So it's no big deal. No big deal. But if it's not done, it's not a core measure, you don't get credit for it. So I think respiratory therapy records should have all this. Bronchodilator therapy, basically talk to a physician prescribing discharge, decided to perform this twice daily dosing with Atrovent because the patient unable to use meter dose inhaler, or a patient unable to use dry powder inhaler. Those are core measures that will make this hospital look good. Um, I also have my email address here. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have directed toward me. As I mentioned, um, these slides are going to be part of your uh, bailiwick now. Use them as you will. If you want some of the articles that I refreshed in here, I'll be happy to send them to you. You can get them in your hospital library. But this is the way that we start making these changes, and it's something that all hospitals across the United States are going to be doing. And you have a significant COPD patient population. I was delighted to see the data that you presented. It's a real issue here. It's not an astronomical issue, but it's an issue you want to address. And you want to do it now, because come October, when it really gets nasty, you want to have a legacy that, you know, starting in January of this year, here's what we've been doing. How long has your pulmonary rehab program been up and running? We're hitting uh, actual seeing patients about six months. Fantastic. I mean, I couldn't, I just, I, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that because I'm going to tell you that's going to be your godsend. You're going to see so much interest in that pulmonary rehab program and all this stuff starting, it starts hitting administration. Uh, it's, it's a great decide. I don't know how you did it, but God love you for doing it because it really is an important part. You can't do this while the patient is admitted to the hospital. You can start. And I think that measuring their literacy and then communicating that to the pulmonary rehab is a, is a great way to go. Okay. Uh, any comments or questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I don't know how we're doing for time here. You have uh, someone else coming in at 8, 9.30, I guess? Uh, supposed to be here, but they're not here. Okay. No problem. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have or elaborate or on any other thing. I just yeah, sure. Regarding in October, I believe, of this year, we have the ICD-10 codes mm -hmm. are taking effect. Do you see how that's going to impact on the ICD-9? For those of you who are not aware of it right now, there's the ICD-9 is what hospitals use to diagnose what the diagnosis is, and now that's kind of not enough. So they're transitioning to ICD-10. And that's a whole other challenge for hospital record keeping for physicians' offices. It's another, you know, just a nightmare. Uh, it's going to be a little easier because there's going to be a lot more classifications for COPD. Right now you're kind of limited. You have three different 
deep MSDRGs and ICD-9 codes. The tens are going to be much better. They put it off for a couple of years. To be honest with you, I think they're probably going to mandate it goes out another year because there's just so much going on right now. But you're right, you can't deny it. ICD-10 is coming. And it's just another one of those implementation issues that hospital administration has to deal with. In the long run, it's supposed to be a lot better because it'll capture more data in terms of the patient's diagnosis. Yes? Regarding the annual cockle vaccine, mm -hmm. um, that one is like, is the, if patient has COPD, are they eligible? Like, because for normally regular, the annual cockle vaccine is for the uh, patient over 65 years old. Right, right. But if a patient has history of COPD, so they, they should they, they should have the pneumococcal. Below, yeah. you know, if they're less than 65, they, able they, should, they should definitely have the pneumococcal. It's, it's a once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. But annual flu vaccination for everybody. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Is it, uh, isn't there like two doses for the pneumococcal? I think it's one. Uh, I, I, I'm not so sure. I think it's one from what they've told me. It's, it's, one, it's once in a lifetime along with shingles. And some people recommend they should also have their shingles vaccination, which is a once in a lifetime if they've had chicken pox. Because, again, that would just exacerbate their COPD. But, again, the whole purpose here is to draw attention to the fact that the physician needs to prescribe, at some point in time, immunization therapy for these patients. It's the standard in the gold guidelines. Um, there's been a rise, from my understanding, in childhood asthma. How much do you see that as playing a role in later COPD? Uh, I'll be honest with you, and, again, I'm not... Offending anybody, there are a lot of physicians that feel that COPD and asthma are like this. Now, you have to understand, asthma in its purest sense in the child is really reversible with proper care and with triggers and so forth. There might be some components of asthma with COPD, which would kind of add another layer of complexity, but I don't think there's a causal relationship. If you have asthma, you're going to get COPD. But quickly, if they have asthma and it's being exacerbated by secondhand smoke and the environment is not conducive, and it's not being maintained, a weak lung is a lot more susceptible to smoking than a strong lung. So behavior is very much a part of preventing the asthmatic from developing in the COPD. Do we have data or, or any kind of information? You mentioned that ALPHA's... The ALPHA-1. The ALPHA-1s. Yeah, right. Are there larger populations? No, they're about... Right now there's an ALPHA trypsin and trypsin deficiency uh, foundation. Okay. And they estimate there's about 25,000 patients right now of that 12 to 15 million that have the alpha-1 phenomena for COPD. So it's a small population, but the test to rule it out is very, very simple. And so the suggestion is all COPD patients, and they say, well, you know, if they've been smoking for 35 years, why waste it? But at the same time, they may also have the alpha-1 deficiency. Uh, but what's really important is that you see a 30-year-old and they have COPD, and they've never smoked, you want to get that alpha-1 test. And because the treatment's the same, yeah. but now they're more at risk because you're getting them younger. And in work with comp situations, would that be? Well, oh, absolutely. That's total disability. Right. Total okay. disability. Absolutely. And the other thing we're talking about, um, there's been a change in how we're looking, or in the, in the future we're going to be progressing to this, of how we determine malnutrition in mm -hmm. patients. And you talked about the health risks. Malnutrition should be a absolutely no question about it, and I and I'm finding out more and more from my dietitians and my nutritionists, uh, because again, how did they utilize the food sources that they have? Because their oxidative metabolism is compromised. So that's right. So you want to have proper diet. So pulmonary rehab, I would imagine, would pull in a lot of good nutrition because again, we're now recognizing. And when you get into this, it's kind of like you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. You start getting depression is really a big, big part of that. Mm -hmm. And good nutrition is a big part of that because that gives them a better Krebs cycle. That means they're more efficient when they actually do use their muscles. So diet's a big part of this. And it's really hard because these are people who've had 30 years of lousy behavior. And i got to tell you, a lot of caregivers basically say, you know, why bother you? You're the one responsible for this. But you know what, on the new malnutrition guidelines, COPD and the factors of COPD are not part of the American, of the academies. And, um, and again, that's out of sight, out of mind. I think that needs to Oh, be no question there. about it. Absolutely. No question about it. Comprehensive pulmonary rehab will have nutritionists in there. And when you look at the new chronic care model that they're talking about, this patient-centered <laughs> medical home, nutrition is a big part of that because when these patients went to the community, we want them to have healthy living styles. Mm -hmm. You know? We don't want to just kind of treat the disease and then continue to have erratic behavior, no exercise, and crappy diet, and 
you know, we just really need to really well, try to make it work. It's actually physical. They physically cannot get around the sure. they can. They need the caregiving, or they physically can't take it in. Especially in this, your state. And then there are some there are supplemental nutritional um, ways that we can get protein in. Sure. Now, so it's a, it's a team concept, no question about it. And we can do all the work in the world on their lungs, but if we don't address this, or if they have osteoarthritis, we don't have a, a you know an occupational therapist teaching them how to use their hands more efficiently. It's it's wasted. It's got to be all done. And I learned that very easily when I went to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation meeting for the first time this year. What an eye opener that was. Uh, when I started in practice back in the 70s, the average age for a cystic fibrosis, newly diagnosed, they were lucky they made it into their teens. It was a catastrophic disease. Today, cystic fibrosis patients are managed by a full-on team. There's the physician, there's the pharmacist, there's the nurse practitioner, there's the physical therapist, the respiratory therapist, the medical social worker, the dietitian. Now there's also family practice and there's also uh, genetic counseling because the average age today of a cystic fibrosis patient is 47 years of age. They're having kids, they're having families. Yeah. And the only reason that works is because there's this non-hierarchical team. And I couldn't put my finger on it and finally I did. And I said, you know, the problem is that with COPD, we blame the patient. You're responsible. Cystic fibrosis, but for the act of God, there go I. It was genetic. They inherited it. So we have this affection. We've got to avoid blaming the COPD patient. We learned the lesson back in the 80s with the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. I don't want to take care of those patients. You didn't take care of what happened. The blood supply got tainted, and it became a public health mess. And now we recognize, even though it might be response, they might be responsible to the behavior, we've got to take care of these patients. And COPD is no, is no different. And it's hard. You never want to say, those, they, they, never put, they just won't quit smoking. That's the wrong thing to say. Talking to an addiction counselor, and they'll say they are unable to quit because they're addicted. And that's why tobacco cessation specialists will talk about is you don't just wag a finger and show a picture and expect them to change. You gotta do all kinds of intervention. Brings us one more question. Sure. I live in the San Gabriel Valley, so we're very <coughs> highly focused on respiratory because there's a high um, respiratory rate in the sure. Glendora. Azusa area, and we have a lot of um, mining operations out there. Um, in, in addition, also in Riverside, um, we, there's a lot of us out there and families out there. So the question is, is there much being done in, you know, yeah, we blame the patient for smoking, but darn it, I would think that a lot of what we have in the air is also... It is, it is problematic, and again, research yeah, articles that the research is there. The problem is that's one of those preliminary climate change. It's one of those just, it's, it's the third rail, you don't want to touch it because know, it's so politically unattractive. <laughs> but the reality is you have to. And like I said, just look at that picture of people in China. They're, they're facing a major burden, and plus they also smoke. So I guess the way I would look at it is kind of, if you're going to be in an environment that's already polluted, why additionally pollute by using tobacco? But do we have any research articles about how inhalants just from these kinds of operations? Well, they're usually done in epidemiology schools of public health, and they're very, very esoteric, and yeah. they don't tend to get a lot of legs because of the fact that it's... You know, a lot of things we just don't want to know. Yeah. Uh, I like to think because I can't see the smog that it's better, but then you realize the stuff you can't see is probably worse than what you can see. Mm -hmm. okay. See, so it's really it's one our society. No question, our society. Just look at the tobacco industry. They get subsidized to the tune of two hundred billion dollars a year from the government because it's an agricultural crop, and yet on the other side, Medicare is saying stop smoking. <laughs> there was a great article in the LA Times thing two weeks ago. What would happen if everybody quit smoking? And they were talking about all this catastrophic decrease in revenue, and the tax revenue would be lost, and this would be lost, and the end of the game was we want more people to smoke. You know, it's a kind of a <laughs> crazy way to look at it, but, you know, you get tuned into that in terms of its, its effect. Okay. Uh, thanks again. Appreciate the heads up, and I appreciate all your work.